referring to God's call on our lives. Um, there are many decisions we have before us because of free will. God graciously offers to us many opportunities. And we need to decide whether to say yes to that opportunity, no to that opportunity, or gosh, I don't, I don't think it's God that's speaking to me in this. Well, it all begins with God's grace. God loves you. God loves all of us. And that love is the beginning point of our journey. It all begins with God's grace. We have uh, a choice. We have a choice to decide yes to that grace that's being offered, that grace that is calling us into deeper relationship with God. We call it in the Methodist circles, prevenient grace, that grace that goes before, that grace that calls us deeper. We can say no to that grace, any of us can, or we can say yes. We can make that decision for God's love, to receive that gift, that free gift of, of love and grace forgiveness of sins and then in that decision there is also a next level sort of if you make the decision for God's grace say yes Lord even within that calling God continues to call us into a life of following Christ, a life of discipleship, right? So hopefully all of us have not only said yes to God's love and grace, but also yes to that calling to follow Christ, to, to living, living out the grace at work in our lives. We are justified by grace, and then the Holy Spirit works in us through sanctification, where we are growing up, maturing in the faith. And that involves saying yes to that calling to follow Christ, to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Within that yes... God's calling continues. So the yes could be a calling to uh, work outside of the church. There, there are almost any profession you can say yes to your calling and live it out as a lawyer, a doctor, a, a garbage collector, a teacher archaeologist, whatever it is that God may be calling you to do, you're still a Christian. So there's non-church work or there's work within the church. God may be calling you to church work. So if we would say yes to that side of this decision, that leads to... Ooh. You could be called to continue as a lay person, which, is, which means you, are, you will not be ordained within the church. But your ministry may continue on in the church as a lay person. And, you know, the church secretary, the custodian, um, Christian education, youth pastor. There are various ministries within the lay ministry in the church, local pastor, also uh, this thing called certified lay, ooh, 
Certified lay ministry. I love the fire stuff. That's really cool. Certified lay ministry. And um, Greg will be talking more about that later. So that's under uh, the responsibility of the committee that's putting this on this weekend. So keep that in mind. Certified lay ministry. The other side, more fire ordained ordained ministry within the church ordained ministry is is set apart ministry uh, with particular responsibilities uh, set apart by the church by God for particular responsibilities within the church and if you say yes to that calling in your life under ordained there are other choices there too you could be ordained as an elder or you could be ordained as a deacon. Big finale. Thank you. Thank you. That's the 11 right there. That's the 11. <laughs> So what we're going to do uh, as the Enlistment and Interpretation Committee, we are responsible for the certified lay ministry, elder, and deacon. Describing that to you, answering questions about those things. So, um, Greg, why don't you come and just share what you see the elder, uh, the elder ministry as what that's all about. All right, God is good. And all the time. Now you're a little early. Y'all were a little weak on the more formal response. The Lord be with you. All right. So you are awake, huh? Okay. Uh, it's just my way of introducing myself. I, I really do believe God is good because I know God has been good in my life. Now I'm going to give you four words. A little bit of a brief definition behind those four words about what an ordained elder is. And then I'm going to try to flesh that out and who I am as Greg Johnson. We just came through Christmas, right? And that's God coming in the flesh of the person of Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to have to flesh out that part of who we are, what, whatever it is that you're called to do, whoever it is you're called to be. And in the case of being ordained, we'll see how that is through me. Okay, four words. Word. Sacrament. Order. Service. Let me say that one more time. Word, sacrament, order, service. Okay, that's what an ordained elder is ordained to within the United Methodist Church. Word, sacrament, order, service. Now, it's going to take you a minute to get there. Okay, if you graduate from high school, you need to have an undergrad degree. You've got to have a, a, a master's in theology, divinity, something like that. And then you're probably going to have to wait two more years after that to um, become ordained. So we're talking a four-year undergrad degree, maybe three years of a, a master's program, and then two more years of some type of provisional status. That's what, nine years? Ten years maybe? Nine years, and that's at the earliest. Oh my God, nine years. I have to wait nine years. Okay, let me put it in another kind of time frame. Let's suppose we discovered you had a tumor in your brain. Pretty serious stuff, right? Hey, you know what? I got called to neurosurgery today, and I'm going to operate on you tomorrow. Anybody ready to jump on the operating table with me? <laughs> Probably not. There's some pieces in, in your life and some parts of theology and formulation of who you are and what it is that we are as Christians and also what we are as United Methodists that we want you to experience, not just learn, but also experience. Now, you got to think about it. If you hear some of the stories of some pastors that have been in the news, are those usually good stories or bad stories? Bad stories. And we're not talking about neurosurgery here, though as important and critical as that is. We're talking about something eternal. We're talking about the lives and souls of people, of people that may never come to know God unless they see or hear it in you. Okay? So... There is this time constraint that goes with that and some pieces that we want you to accumulate and experience in your life. And it's part of what the church would ask of you. Okay? So that's kind of the nine-year piece 
Okay, so just kind of bear with that. Now there's a little folder in the back table there by where Jerry Wagamuth is. Uh, it's a little piece on the ordained elder. Feel free to pick one of those up. Word. We think about the, when we think about church, we think about the preacher, we think about the pastor, the elder, he's preaching or she's preaching and is usually on a Sunday behind a pulpit, right? It's kind of the image most folks have. Anybody know what a pulpit is? You, too? you got an idea? Piece of furniture, right, in the church, right? Well, in nautical terms, usually it's on a boat, on a ship, and it's a kind of railing piece in the bow. Okay, that's kind of the the nuts and bolts of the way that is. You ever see Jaws? Remember Quinn, he was out there looking at the shark on that little piece that went out past the bow? Well, that's there for two reasons. One, to kind of see where the fish are so we know where to, to tell the pilot where to go. Also, to look out for danger, rocks, as you kind of go into the shore. That's kind of what the pulpit is, okay? To kind of help the people avoid danger, the, rock, the crashing of the rocks, as well as to where to go to fish, okay, and where to go and get the good stuff at. That's kind of what that pulpit is. So that's kind of what we think about word. Not just only the, the preaching of the scripture, but also the teaching of it. But even more so beyond a Sunday morning experience. And I'll kind of flesh that out in a minute. Sacrament. How many sacraments do we have as United Methodists? Two. Baptism in the Lord's table, Holy Communion. And we administer those things because Jesus told us to do that. Okay? Go and make, and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as often as you do this, which is not a suggestion, as often as you do this, remember me, his body, his blood, the sacraments okay, of baptism in the Lord's table. Order. Order isn't like, uh, I'll take my hamburger medium rare. Okay? Okay? It's how do we set the church in order? There are some pieces. Uh, um, Pastor Ed talked about uh, the structure of the church. Okay? There are some pieces there. And people have, believe it or not, we're, the only, we're not the only ones to discover Jesus and got on fire for him. There were people that had done that before us. And there's some pieces that they uh, sidestepped as mind uh, fields and saw some things that worked well for us. And so sometimes we just kind of follow in on those pieces. Again, we don't want a neurosurgeon that just decided we're going to operate today because I discovered I'm a neurosurgeon today. They went through some wars and they saw some things. And they try to lay out a path to help the rest of the church go through that. So there are pieces in the church to kind of order the life of the body of Christ. Okay? Service, of course, that doesn't uh, need a whole lot of explanation, but it's even beyond being ordained, something that you do for the community, whether it's in the church or outside the church, with church folks or outside of church folks. And sometimes it's better that you are in service outside the church um, with that. Now, um, with that being said, how many ordained elders do we have in here? If you don't mind, would you stand up? Stand up. Stand up. There you go. Take a look around. Your necks actually rotate. Look at all these different ordained elders, all right? None of us look alike, do we? God, thank you. I don't look like that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are my colleagues as ordained elders. Okay. Now, that's what I want to say. Ordained elders, we all are ordained to that. Word, sacrament, order, and service. But how we flesh that out is different. Now, is it okay if I be Greg with you for a minute? Is that all right? Sure. No, come on now. Is it okay if I be Greg with you for a minute? Because yeah, I don't want you to get mad at me later. Because, well, you shouldn't have been like that, Greg. <laughs> okay, let's be real clear. We live in a society where we cannot sell toothpaste without some kind of sexual innuendo. Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. And I did say sex. Okay? Okay? You've been called by a holy and righteous God. And you're in covenant relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ. I am not asking you. I'm telling you, stay pure, stay true to the covenant, okay? The standard of God is celibate outside of marriage. That means no sex. And monogamous in it. That means sex with only your partner. I'm not getting a whole lot of amens with that. Okay, and again, I, use, I chose sex because these pastors, these people we see on TV in a negative light, it's either sex and money is why they're on TV. Or maybe sex and money. Okay? But not only for a puritanical, abstaining kind of piece of remaining pure in your sexual commitment and covenant and relationship, but to, let's regrasp it. Let's take it back from the world. It was a gift given from God, meant for us to be enjoyed, okay? Between only one other person in your life. 
is a gift that God has given us. Let's re-grab what it is. Now, you're probably wondering, why am I saying that? Sacrament. You're baptized into a covenant relationship so that we only do it one time because God gets it right. God will never break covenant with us even though we may break covenant with God. We remember that covenant relationship of Jesus giving of his body and his blood every time we take communion. It is not something we do on Sunday. Yes, it is something we do on Sunday, but it's something we live out every day, Monday through Saturday, that covenant relationship. Word, thou shalt not commit adultery. Word, scripture. Live it out in your life every day. Not just hear a message on Sunday. Order of the church, I would dare say, outside the church, the numbers of divorces is at like 60 some percent. And it's pretty close to the same number inside the church. Why? Because somehow or another we forgot the covenant relationship that we're in with God. Now granted, we're human and things happen and we need to have allowances for grace in our lives. But today, young men and women of God called into the ministry of the Holy One of God, I implore you, stay true to your covenant and purity and it's all holiness. It's a wonderful calling. But not only your life, it's not only your calling, it's those lives of the people that God is going to send you to. They're out there cutting themselves eating disorders because they abase themselves. They don't see themselves as worthy of anything. They're abusing drugs and alcohol because they have no other form of finding peace in their life, no other way of getting some kind of comfort and solace in their being. There are others that are grabbing at power and money, thinking that's going to make them a more whole and wholesome, wholesome person. Church, it's a hurting world out there. But not for us to feel guilty, but what a wonderful opportunity to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And notice I said, good news. But you know what? You can't give what you don't have. You got to find it for yourself and live it out for yourself. So not only do you speak it, you live it for them. You live it with them and you encourage them. And that you have it in you, you can look in somebody's eye and say, God can put that in your life too. There's something better for you. God's got a best plan for you. Okay. That's how that fleshes out my life. Okay. One more thing here as far as service, how I came into ordained ministry. How many of you out here today consider yourself a person of color or different ethnicity? Would you stand up? Would you stand up, please? Stand up. Come on. Okay. Four of us. Okay. You can sit down now. Four. I think we have close to 80 in our gathering together. Our conference is a pretty white conference. And today I'll uh, be Japanese instead of African American. That gives another ethnic group, okay? And I'm actually Japanese and uh, African American. Um, my calling to ordain ministry, I looked into the 1997 conference journal, which is a accumulation summation written document of our annual conferences and within that within our at that time was the central pennsylvania conference and at that time less than two percent of our membership were people of color and less than two percent were clergy of color and within that i grew up in the african-american community so i considered myself african-american at that time less than one percent of our members of the annual conference and less than one percent of uh, the clergy were african-americans and I had an opportunity to go to school. I was a local pastor. I've been a pastor for 11 and a half years. I've been an ordained elder for two and a half. Um, Woohoo! Yeah, thank God. And there is grace. Trust me, there is grace. <laughs> there is grace if God could call me to be a pastor. But I looked in and I said, if I can go to school and become an ordained elder and, and give encouragement for one more person to do that. And I felt like I fulfilled that call in my life. And that's part of my service to help our conference and our community not become more multiracial and multiethnic, but that we have a heart to see what voice is out there that's not being heard. What part of our community that is not in our congregation sharing in the wondrous riches of our worship and our fellowship, okay, and all the blessings that Christ gives us. And if you look, you'll find them. They may be out there washing dishes in a restaurant serving you, uh, stocking shelves at night. They're out there. We just got to be intentional about looking for them and embracing them and including them. Because, you know, um, I think you know the Lord's Prayer. Know that? Kind of know that little prayer? That's scripture too, by the way. That's word. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. 
Okay, excellent. Now, and uh, any of you read Revelations in the back of the book, we win, right? So whatever we're struggling with today, just realize we win at the back of the book, right? We win. woo all right? All right. But there's a scene in heaven where the angels are flying around the throne of grace, and they're singing, holy, holy, holy. Have you read that part in the scripture? Okay, that's a pretty diverse community. You have angelic creatures worshiping God with humans, and they all got voice. Well, if that's the picture of heaven, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, how do we intentionally go out with you, the Holy Spirit, and help make that happen? That's my service piece. Okay, I told you I would flesh out what an ordained elder looks like to me, okay, and who I am, and that's kind of what I do. I don't like to talk to you straight up, and I try to make it personal, okay? And if it hurts, I don't mean to hurt you, but I do want to make it real. The church has been stricken with too many scandals just because we can't keep our covenant relationships. Okay? And we need to be in service as the ideal of what we think heaven is, that it may be that on this earth through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, that the world may know that Jesus is come and has come. I'm very sacramental in that covenant relationship. You heard a little bit of it in me when I said Moses. Okay, those kind of things mean something to me. Jesus said they would know that he has come if we have love for one another, the way that Jesus loved us. The way Jesus loves me is the way I should love you. The way that Jesus loves you, should, you should love me. And we should be willing to show it and not, be unash- and not be ashamed by it. It is a good thing to be called a follower of Christ Jesus. We have good news, and it's all good because God is good. And all the time. Word, sacrament, order, service. Eric's presentation, you saw that there was two ordained positions. That's very dissimilar from other denominations. Uh, Most don't have that option. And it's a very cool option. And when it came along, I was really excited. And I felt called to that. So I sort of had to apply to the board over again and go through the process and the steps a second time. Not the educational piece, because that I had already taken care of when I was consecrated to diaconal ministry. But I um, went through the process again to be ordained a deacon. And now you, as young people, looking at your choices, I think it's great because you can say, you know, here's the differences. Here's where I feel my gifts are. I've heard a lot of discussion about gifts this weekend, which is awesome. And I see a lot of you with your, you know, showing your um, heart in your face and in your body language and in your sharing that shows you're really, really open and you're really wrestling, and I'm very touched to see that. And what I'm hoping is that these presentations that we're making in this session right now will help clarify a few things for you. Um, um, Okay, the the stuff isn't up there that was up there before, but I can remind you of what we have said so far. Um, When you're ordained in to be an elder, you're ordained, as Greg said, to the ministry of word, which is preaching the Bible, and sacraments, which is baptism and communion, and order, which is ordering the life of the church. So that'd be like your shepherding part of the job description. And then service is all the things that have to do with helping others, obviously. So what's a deacon ordained to? It's a different description. It's ordained to word and service. So there's still the piece of preaching possibly for some people, although I have deacon friends who really don't do much with preaching, but they're living the word. And then there's the service piece, which obviously elders and deacons have in common, as do all of us, regardless ordained or lay, have service in common. But it's really nice, I think, that it's in there as a reminder that this is who we are and that that's what we're called to be. So you're called to be a servant and a leader, servant leader. And you can find a lot of good literature on that to help you with, um, with understanding that concept. Um, there's a long history of diaconal becoming deacon. The way it is right now, um, deacons um, have full membership in their annual conference like their elders, their colleagues. There are standards for their employment as far as minimum pay and benefits and how um, the 
what, what a church must offer, just like there is for an elder, but there's very big differences as well. So where an elder is appointed to their church and it's sort of a guaranteed job, job security, which you can't say about very many professions, for a deacon, you find your own employment and you're appointed after you find something that the bishop approves. So you would search for a job, you would interview for a job, you'd be hired by that organization and they would pay you. And you would go back to your um, a bishop that you belong to that conference. Like I said, you've gone through all the steps, all the education, just like the elder, you belong to that conference. You would go back to your bishop in a, in a request and they would grant you, yes, that is a valid expression of the deacon's calling. You are appointed there. And you stay there until that relationship with that employer ends for what, whatever reason. So it's very different from the elder in that way. So the elders, they itinerate and they order the life of the church usually. Usually they're preaching, usually they're in pulpit ministry, although I think Eric mentioned extension ministries or that's coming up later. So <laughs> I don't want to confuse you, but there are elders who also do other things like teach. But let me get back to the more basic differences because I don't want to confuse you. Deacons can do a lot of different things. And I'll tell you what some of my friends do and what I do. I've always been in the field of Christian education, going back to my diaconal ministry up till now. I've been um, in youth ministries, children's ministries, adult ministries, anything educational in the life of the church. So usually I would be hired by a church that wants someone in addition to their pastor to help make sure that the educational ministries of the church are going well. Um, Amanda, where are you? Amanda Bressler, right there. Stand up, because people have questions, so they can come to me or Amanda afterwards. There she is. She's about to be um, certified in the area of youth ministry, and she's going for deacon's orders. Okay. And she um, can give you a lot of insight into how it is going now, because these things change all the time. All the requirements and the order of things that you have to do changes a lot when you're going through the process to become an elder or a deacon. So uh, she's more up to speed on what's required right now. But what she did is she got a master's in youth ministry and then took additional the theology classes. What I did years and years ago was got a master's of theology and didn't need additional theological classes. I have friends who are in music ministry who are deacons. I have friends who are in hospice work, different kinds of chaplaincy work, which could be prison, military, or hospital. Um, I have a good friend who does, uh, most of the ministers here know, who does um, outreach to the homeless and the addicted. And her area is sort of called hospitality. And a lot of you in my small group have a gift of hospitality, so there's a lot of ways to express that because she makes the church every Wednesday night where she works a home and a safe place for people who might not have a home all week long, except when they come in to her church in Chambersburg once a week hospitality. Um, uh, youth ministry, missions, music, chaplains, there's, and teaching. So there's a lot of variety. So if you're here saying, well, I feel called to full-time ministry, I don't really feel called to pulpit ministry, which I've heard a couple people say these last two days, um, this might be an area for you, but why would I? Couldn't I just go into that line of work without being ordained and having that connection to the United Methodist Church? Yes, you could. I find that for me to be ordained in the United Methodist Church provides connection, support, accountability, um, a home, an identity, right? There's a lot of things that are benefits or pluses for, for me, and it has always kind of been in the field of Christian education, but I've been able to evolve how I express that. So when I was younger, I was a little more interested in youth ministry. Now I'm a little bit more interested in adult ministries. So back then I did some adult ministry, but more youth. Now I do some youth, but more adult. So it's the kind of thing that has allowed me to, um, as I've changed a little bit, the ministry has allowed me to, to, um, be flexible, okay, and to adapt with it. And you can in, in, as an elder as well. You can as an elder as well, but maybe a little less so, right? Because an elder is kind of like the pastor does the Sunday preaching and 
the visitation, and there's certain things that are kind of built in there. With a the deacon, I find that there is some more variety. Can I open it up to questions? Because I feel like this, there's so many here today, as opposed to other God's Call events, that didn't, um, that, this, that this time that are interested in this. And I just, I'm not sure if I'm a dress. See, I told you. <laughs> He's going to say no. So don't look at it. Don't look at his answer. Um, you said that you're appointed to an organization. Now, did you mean like a church? Okay, that was a good question. In my case, I've always been appointed to serve at a church, but I'm supposed to as a deacon. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I'm supposed to as a deacon make a very obvious connection between the church and the world. So, for example, in one of my churches, I was Christian education, but I did a tutoring program and an after-school program that was almost all on church families. But my appointment was to the church, but I had ministry outside. Right now, I'm a pastor of discipleship. So it's, a lot of it is, is within. But some of those other people that I mentioned that are friends of mine, that are deacons, they might be employed by a hospital or a prison. So there are other options. It's not always to be employed by a church, but you're supposed to have a relationship with the church and show the bridge between the church and the world and you're supposed to be a servant leading by example, serving t into the world to the least of these as a deacon. I'm so glad you asked that question. Yes? Um, you have to have a special, you're, you can do weddings and funerals, but not, um, we can't do um, the sacraments unless we have a special dispensation or a special, like, like a local pastor, like the bishop says, you can. In, Yeah, I think you would have to have a special, uh, I don't want to say dispensation. I don't know the right word. What's the right word? <laughs> Permission. <laughs> so, Okay. Um, I know that people probably have more questions, but I know we have to move on. Thank you for letting me share. There's a lot more I could say, but that hopefully gives you a little glimpse. All right. So those are the two ordained ministries. And... Uh, Certified lay ministry. Greg is a, a district superintendent, so we've asked him to share about that. One of the things that I have appreciated about this Methodist movement ever since the beginning is it, it tends to be, or has at least in the past, been a very practical movement. The mission must come first. Amen? The mission of making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That comes first. Out in the world, around in the communities. From the very beginning of our uh, heritage, there have been times in which there are more ministry opportunities than there oh, bless you, that there are more ministry opportunities in this world than we have elders or deacons to head them up. And so it comes a question of leadership. How do we develop new ministries? How do we spread ourselves ever farther and thinner uh, and provide the kind of leadership that is necessary when there are only so many elders, there are only so many deacons uh, to, to go around? Uh, there is a relatively new program uh, and ministry opportunity within the United Methodist Church called Certified Lay Ministry. Certified Lay Ministers are not pastors, um, but they function an awful lot like pastors. At least they can. Uh, I say it's, it's relatively new. Uh, we have had this kind of ability for lay people to serve churches as preachers as teachers, as uh, folks that visit and provide care uh, to, to the membership uh, in a variety of ways uh, for ever since the, the Methodist movement began. Uh, but we have a way now of claiming that and preparing folks for this certified lay ministry in a way that we haven't uh, in, in quite a long time. Certified lay ministers uh, are lay people who are members of United Methodist congregations who are felt, feel a calling by God to, to take a little bit step deeper into leadership in the church. Uh, they will most likely will come through what's known as our, our lay speakers programs. Anybody here that's gone through the basic lay speakers course? Okay. Uh, there's two levels of that. When you are a certified lay speaker, you are able to enter into this ministry. Um, the, it's not ordained, but there, there are some courses and some, some education uh, to, to train these folks that is provided through uh, the annual conference. Uh, each district has some ways to provide those courses. And these people can be used and appointed by superintendents to preach in pulpits. Uh, they may also be deployed to help pastors when there's a little bit more work uh, 
than one pastor uh, can, can handle. Uh, in my district, I'm from the Wellsboro district, and uh, there are a lot of small towns and small churches who may or may not be able to afford a pastor, but there are viable Christian witnesses and ministries going on in those areas. We have several people that are uh, leading the churches, preaching every Sunday, uh, who are lay people through the Certified Lay Ministry Program. Um, we are uh, committed to the ministry of laity. Do you hear that? As one of the things I'm sure you've heard before is to be a leader in ministry in the United Methodist Church, you don't necessarily have to be ordained. And there are some varieties in that. By our baptism, we're all leaders uh, and ministers and servants. Uh, and so these folks are used in a variety of, of ways. If you'd like more information about the Certified Lay Minister program and track. So some of the ways that you can answer God's call to think about where God may be calling you.